Okay, I want to uh, thank you for coming out uh, to this news conference uh, this afternoon. I wanted to uh, provide uh, an update, uh, perhaps the final update, uh, regarding um, the terrible tragedy that we had in our city uh, yesterday, as well as the event that happened uh, Thursday night. And I wanted to uh, begin um, by highlighting the victims. Um, I think sometimes we forget about the victims. And uh, we focus more on the, uh, the suspects and the people that are responsible for the tragedy. Um, so I want to begin by uh, focusing on those individuals that lost their lives this last week in the city of Fresno. And I want to begin um, with victim number one, who is 25-year-old uh, Carl Williams of Fresno. Uh, he was a supervisor um, at Monument Security, also a supervisor for Toys R Us. And... Uh, Carl Williams lost his life on April 13th at the Motel 6 at Blackstone and Ashland uh, after being shot multiple times from close range. Turn that light down. Victim number two is 37 year old Mark James Gassett of Fresno. Mr. Gassett uh, was shot in front of 215 uh, North Fulton. The victim number three is 34-year-old Zachary David Randalls. Zachary was an employee for PG&E, was on a ride-along with a PG&E worker, field worker, uh, as part of his employment. Um, Zachary was required to go out and ride along, even though he was assigned to the call center. Again, Zachary David Randall from Fresno, and he was shot and killed in front of 330 North Van S, apartment 108. The last victim is 58-year-old David Martin Jackson. Mr. Jackson was uh, shot and killed and found at 149 North Fulton in the parking lot of Catholic Charities. I want to uh, take this time to offer my condolences to all of the family uh, who have lost these loved ones in the senseless acts of violence in our city and to uh, convey to them that we will be um, praying for them. Uh, and I know that there are a number of folks in this city uh, who will also uh, be praying as well. In fact, I know that there are some planned vigils. Uh, some of those have already occurred in the city. And uh, I also understand that there will be a number of church services that are occurring this weekend, um, and they will all be in prayer for these victims and their families. Uh, we have been in touch with them, working. Our victim advocates have been working very, very closely with the families. I've also been in contact with uh, Congressman Jim Costa this morning uh, in making sure that, uh, that adequate resources are provided to these families in, in the way of uh, ensuring that 100% of their burial expenses are paid for and any other um, costs that they may acquire are taken care of um, through this federal funding. And he has assured me that that will occur. I want to give you a... Uh, somewhat of a an overview a detailed overview of, of what transpired uh, including um, Corey Mohammed yesterday not only giving a uh, statement to our detectives that lasted for several hours that highlighted um, where what had occurred on Thursday evening April 13th as well as what transpired from that point forward all the way up until the murders yesterday and him being taken into custody and I think it uh, is very enlightening to shed um, some light in terms of what, what truly uh, transpired. Uh, he also went with our detectives yesterday and last night uh, to the Motel 6, pointed out exactly where uh, he was standing, where the shooting occurred, why, uh, and then took uh, our detectives out to the Van S and Warman area, uh, the Van Fulton area, Mildreda, 
and uh, walked them through that and shared with them exactly what transpired, which is very consistent with the evidence that we've found and witness statements. And we're going to show a map of that as well as uh, some embedded gunshot detection so that uh, you will get a, a feel for what transpired uh, yesterday. So beginning on, uh, on April 13th, which is Thursday night at the Motel 6, um, you won't need that light off at this point. The um, Corey Mohammed had went to the Motel 6 to uh, meet a, a female. He was going to stay there at that location. And again, uh, as a result of that, he was contacted by security. And uh, there was a, a verbal altercation that occurred. Eventually, they were going to ask him to leave, which they did. Uh, he wanted his money back. He went back to the lobby. And uh, there was a confrontation outside uh, in terms of a verbal uh, argument that occurred between the female and an unarmed security guard. And uh, that unarmed security uh, guard is Mr. Williams, Carl Williams. Um, what, what Corey McDonald said uh, was that he uh, fired uh, his weapon at Carl Williams uh, because he felt that Carl Williams had disrespected him. And that uh, he fired those rounds from close range, uh, again, with the intent to kill him. And uh, after the shooting, he ran uh, behind the location actually climbed onto the roof of the 7-Eleven and hid there throughout the night and actually watched our investigators come to the location and conduct an investigation of that, uh, of that shooting. And uh, he stayed on that um, rooftop until morning. Uh, after everyone had left, uh, he got up and then left the location and went by to a nearby school where he uh, hid out by a trash dumpster. Uh, he then took a city bus that same day to the area of Milburn and Herndon. Uh, he stayed in a ravine uh, Friday through Sunday where he practiced uh, what was described to him as voodoo rituals. He said he is Muslim uh, but prays to seven different gods uh, and described one of his gods as Aguna. He then uh, walked uh, after on Sunday, he walked to an area uh, west of there where he then cut off his braids and um, set them on fire. And he slept in that area until Tuesday morning. He then on Tuesday morning walked to the Tower District. Uh, his intent was to go to a business called the Brass Unicorn. And that was for the purpose of buying some crystals as part of a voodoo ritual. Uh, he realized once he got there that the store was not open. And so then he went to Starbucks. It was at the uh, Starbucks that he was able to access Wi-Fi uh, turned on the news and um, saw ABC 30 News and recognized uh, that he was listed as a suspect involved in the murder of the Motel 6. And uh, what he told our detectives last night um, was that once he saw that he was wanted for murder, he was not going to go down for shooting a security guard uh, for disrespecting him, but that he was going to kill as many white males as possible. And that's what he set out to do that day. He said he did not like uh, white men and that white people um, were responsible for keeping the black people down. He said the originals, referring to non-white, um, Hispanic, African American, uh, needed to have their own land with their own laws. He bragged about how comfortable he was with uh, firearms. He said he'd been carrying firearms since he was uh, the age of 12. And in fact, when he was 12, he said that he ended up shooting an adult and uh, was uh, prosecuted as a juvenile for negligent discharge of a firearm. We have yet to confirm that. He referred to the gun that he was carrying as a black python. It is a 357 Magnum revolver. And now I want to take you through what uh, he showed us uh, regarding the incident that happened uh, yesterday in the area of Fulton and Van Ness and just uh, north of Divisadero. This incident actually started at 10.43 a.m. and 42 seconds when there was the initial shot spotter um, activation. And uh, he took us through the scene. And that first one is uh, in the area of uh, Van S area uh, where he approached two males who were sitting in a PG&E truck. And that was at 3.30 North Van S. Um, and that vehicle was parked facing northbound on the east side of the street. As he approached the vehicle, 
Uh, he noticed that the driver of that vehicle was a Hispanic male and the passenger in that vehicle was a white male. Uh, he intentionally targeted the uh, white male and began to shoot at him with the intent to kill him. And that uh, passenger is 34-year-old Zachary Randles. Those are the four gunshots that were fired into the, the pickup. Uh, part of those rounds were fired on the passenger side, and at least one of those rounds were fired at the rear of the pickup as the vehicle traveled northbound out of the area. McDonald said he then uh, walked southbound on, full, or, uh, southbound on Van Ness and then westbound on Mildreda. Uh, when he saw an individual, a uh, white male, who walked out of 934 East Mildreda, located on the south side of the street, and he fired two rounds at this individual, saw him fall to the ground, I thought he was hit, and then began to reload. One of those rounds struck 922 East Mildreda, which is a house adjacent to uh, 934 and uh, again fortunately the white male was not struck uh, he then ran inside of his residence uh, Corey Mohammed said he saw him run inside thought about going after him but decided to go uh, continue westbound it was at that time that uh, Corey Mohammed uh, saw a, a car that was parked on Mildreda facing eastbound on the south side of the street uh, there were two occupants inside, but he couldn't see who they were. Uh, that vehicle attempted or started to drive away westbound, I'm sorry, eastbound on Mildreda. And it was at that time that uh, Mohammed fired one round at that vehicle. Uh, and as the, as the vehicle passed, he noticed that that vehicle uh, was occupied by two Hispanic females and stopped firing at that vehicle because of that. And uh, this is the round that was fired. We may not have that round because I don't think gunshot detection picked it up. The, uh, he then went to an alley, which is uh, between Fulton and Van Ness, and it was at that point that he uh, dumped his shell casings. There were six, uh, actually five empty shell casings found there. We believe he emptied six, and one of them is yet to be located. He then proceeded westbound uh, on Mildreda went over to 215 uh, North Fulton, where there was an individual that was standing in front of that location on the sidewalk, and he fired uh, two times, uh, I'm sorry, he struck that individual with one round in the, in the chest area. That individual fell, landed on his back. Corey Mohammed then stood over him and fired two more rounds into him while he was lying on the ground. And that was 37-year-old Mark Gassett. Suspect Muhammad then saw three white males who were at the bus stop on Fulton, and he fired one round uh, in that direction towards him. He thought at that time that he had ran out of bullets, and then he um, unloaded his firearm, dropped the shell casings, reloaded, and what we found at the scene were five empty shell casings and one live round, uh, which he did not fire. And also there were two speed loaders left at that location, one that he had held on to when he had uh, reloaded uh, on Mildreda in the alley, and then the one he reloaded here. After he reloaded, um, he then uh, saw two individuals, uh, all three of those individuals at the bus stop scattered. Two of them ran southbound. Uh, one of those was an older gentleman. Um, and he said that uh, he appeared to be heavier, felt that uh, that was going to be his target. He then chased after him and caught up with him in, at 149 North Fulton, the Catholic Charities parking lot. And he fired uh, two rounds into this individual. And that was, again, at 149 North uh, Fulton. And uh, 
the, the victim at that point um, fell to the ground and uh, was pronounced deceased. That last victim is uh, David Martin Jackson, who is 58 years of age. We also know there were additional rounds fired beyond the two that struck uh, Mr. Jackson. Uh, we located two rounds in, a, in, in cars in the Catholic Charities parking lot. And we also located one round that had struck the Catholic Charities building. And uh, we have not located another round uh, that was fired. Mr. Mohammed uh, then ran southbound on Fulton uh, with a gun wrapped in some clothing. He, um, at that point, did not have any bullets left. He took that gun, wrapped it in the clothing, and he set it down in the area of Fulton and Vorman. And as he did so, there was a Hispanic male that approached him carrying a box filled with food. The two of them met, had a brief discussion, and the Hispanic male walked over to where the clothing was, set the box of food down, and retrieved the handgun from the clothing and ran from the area westbound on Vorman and then ran in a northwesterly direction on Yosemite. Uh, we have a portion of this on video because we know that he ultimately jumped the fence into a backyard at 161 North Yosemite and he emptied the six shell casings from that revolver in the backyard which we have since located. He then took that gun and continued northbound from that area. And so at this time, I want to make a desperate plea to that individual to turn himself in. Light on. I'm asking for this individual, Hispanic male, that picked up that firearm, that ultimately took it to 161 North Yosemite and unloaded the empty shell casings, to turn himself in immediately. Uh, we have video evidence, which we will be analyzing uh, to get a detailed description of who this individual is. We are also processing the box of food, as well as the items contained within that box, uh, to learn of his identity. It would be much, um, much better for him to turn himself into the Fresno Police Department. And he can reach out to Sergeant Larry Bolin, and that number is 287-6579, 287-6579. And I'm asking him to call immediately and return that gun to the police department. The suspect, Corey Mohammed, uh, after dropping the clothes on the ground, he ran southbound on Fulton to Divisadero, immediately saw a police car approaching from the west, and at that point dropped two objects that were in his hands. Uh, those objects are uh, like uh, necklace pendants uh, or charms, um, and he said that they were um, for the purpose of protecting uh, against evil. Um, he also utilized things called amulets, again, charms that protect against uh, evil. Corey Muhammad was asked why he um, did not continue to flee and why he gave up to the police officers. First, he said he respected Fresno police officers, did not want to force them to shoot him, uh, did not want the officers to be placed in a, uh, a spotlight, um, and at the same time, he said he was not a coward. And he said that's what differentiated him but, and, and, a, and a terrorist, in that a terrorist does extreme acts, kills people, but dies for that cause. And uh, that's not what he was going to do. And. Uh, Again, he said he was not affiliated with any terrorist group uh, or any mosque. He hadn't been to a mosque in uh, some 25 years. He claimed that he was Muslim, but again, uh, practiced voodoo. Corey Muhammad's very calloused individual. When he was taking our police officers, our detectives, to various locations uh, last night and yesterday, as he spoke about the shootings and shooting individuals, uh, he did so in a very callous manner, in fact, multiple times laughed as he described what transpired. We allowed uh, Corey Mohammed to speak to his mother last night. He did speak with her, uh, as one mother would. She was crying. And uh, he told her not to cry, 
that uh, he is still alive and that his magic was powerful. And he started laughing. Corey Muhammad is not a terrorist, but he is a racist. And he's filled with hate. And he set out this past week to kill as many people as he possibly could. Fortunately, he was taken into custody a short time after he committed those murders. And uh, he's not going to kill anyone else. And again, I want to thank the detectives that I have here. Uh, Sergeant Detective Larry Boland. I have Sergeant Andre Benson here as well. Lieutenant Dave Madrigal from the Street Violence Bureau. They have been working tirelessly around the clock, making sure that they can put together this investigation uh, along with the other investigators in the Homicide Unit and the Street Violence Bureau and a number of other detectives that have participated in this investigation for the purpose of ensuring that we have the necessary evidence to allow for a successful uh, prosecution of Corey Muhammad. And with that, I'll, uh, we also have uh, 